Hello friends, I am Rob the Dungeon Tutor, here today with another kind of a resume video, showing you the things that I have to kind of give you an insight into the things that I collect, why I collect them, and also so that you know that I understand the material that I have access to things. So if you see something that you're interested in, you can feel free to say, hey, Rob, could you talk about this, or maybe show me how to make a character about that, or that's what I'm here for. So, today's <clears throat> video is about 3rd edition Dungeons and Dragons. Now, <clears throat> I have a lot of 3rd edition stuff. <clears throat> it's the first edition of Dungeons and Dragons where I didn't rely on other people's materials and other people's libraries, which I don't have access to anymore, which is why my selections are somewhat meager, unless I've built them up. But third edition, I grew into. Um, I had, shortly after uh, third edition came out, uh, I got married, I got a place to store books because we got a house. Um, so my collection grew and grew and grew and grew, and I was keeping up for a while with all the different releases as they were coming out, which is <clears throat> generally how you get a thorough collection, but um, not the cheapest way, buying everything at sticker price. So... Um, yeah, I will also mix in a few games that are, or a few books that I have that are tangential to Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I kind of lumped all my third edition stuff together, and, uh, I feel that's fine to put it here. I'm going to be going a lot more briefly over a lot of the things that I have, though, than I did in previous resume videos, because uh, there's quite a bit. <clears throat> so, of course, we have... Uh, to start off, as we do in all Dungeons & Dragons, the Core Player's Handbook. Uh, this is a 3rd edition Player's Handbook. I have two of them. This one I got as part of a collection that I bought. But, uh, obviously you need this to play the game. And this was such a massive change when I first got it in August of 2000 at Gen Con. Uh, because, you know, it's D&D shifted into a completely different direction. And it was very cool. Uh, I... I got it, and I had to win over a lot of my friends who were happy playing 2nd Edition, but once we did, there was no looking back. They really got to enjoy the different features of 3rd Edition, which I will happily go over in another video. Uh, of course, we also have the Dungeon Master's Guide. And we have Monster Manual 1, 2, and 3. I decided for, for fun I got a hold of the 2nd Edition slipcover. Just the slipcover, not the actual book, so I just kind of stuck them in here together. But yep, uh, I do like the uh, the art design they had of having these kind of twisted book covers set into the, the theme and tome of what's inside. Uh, I thought that was a really good idea on their part, and uh, that's why I... I think that the books as a work of art really kind of flourished in this time period, especially... So we have those. I also do have the 3.5 edition Player's Handbook, though. Got it at a discount because it's a soft cover, and I think it came with something else, if I remember right. All right, now it's going to be kind of a little bit more scattershot, but uh, we'll we'll do what we can. Uh, we got, again, I have a friend who loves psionics, so we did get the expanded psionics handbook. Um, I think this is 3.5. This... I thought was a real service played to psionics. They instead of just having something that's just jankily added on, like psionic combat and all that, they tried their best to make it a viable class, which I think they mostly succeeded in, and allowed you to bring a full scion into the party with a lot of different flavors of psionics, including your uh, psi blades, uh, psionic warriors, different you know classes, not just mind melting scions. Um, it was okay. It was okay. I, he's the only one I ever knew who loved psionics, and I would get books just for him. Um, <clears throat> I never had a great desire to play a scion, but, you know, if I was going back to third edition for something new that I've never done before, I would definitely consider it. It wasn't in itself a very bad book at all. Now, because some of these were part of collections, not books that I myself bought, uh, I do have a number of off-brand books that we'll go into in time. 
Uh, then we got the Manual of the Plains. The Manual of the Plains was, again, you, you notice I get this book almost every edition. It's because I'm fascinated with the idea of going to different realities and challenging my players with different encounters uh, throughout. So that one, when that came out, is one I had to get. Um, skip a couple. Now, all of these, these served as the, uh, the kit books, basically. Now, third edition, one of the sea changes they made was rather than need to have the complete warrior's book or the complete wizard's book, instead they made <clears throat> prestige classes that kind of dovetailed into the different adventuring classes. And prestige classes allowed you to do much the same thing that kits did. Sharpen your focus, leave behind things you never really used or cared about, and really focus down on what you do care about, which tended to tip the power curve almost as soon as it was introduced. The first five that were introduced into the DM's Guide, not too bad, really. Uh, nobody, I don't think, was ever going to include the, the, the lore master of, uh, you know, completely breaking the game. And even the Arcane Archer was kind of cool, but not, again, overly devastating. Um, certainly not in the balance of, you know, spell, full spellcasters. But uh, it was a start. It was something that we should have seen coming as going to be just a trickle that overran everything. But these enhanced out the different prestige classes, as well as a lot of gear, as well as talking about the philosophies of the different classes, sure. But these gave you some prestige classes, some of which were still fairly well-grounded and somewhat well-balanced, before you got lost in a wave of ones that were just there to sell books because they were far overpowered. That being said, there were some, there were still some things in here you had to watch for if you really wanted the validity of your game and to be able to balance for everybody. Some of these were ones that you really had to watch for. So, along with Sword and Fist, which was about monks and fighters, interesting combination, you had Masters of the Wild, about druids and rangers, Tome and Blood, wizards and sorcerers, Song and Silence, that's going to be your bards and uh, rogues. And defenders of the faith, your clerics and your paladins. Uh, and uh, Sword and Fist also include barbarians. So, um, All in all, I thought that these were really good works that uh, really helped to flesh out and, again, show us really exactly how 3rd edition was going to be so much more different than 2nd edition in terms of giving everybody the chance to make exactly the kind of character they wanted to make. Now, taken holistically on its own, it's a noble sentiment. What it ended up being, because we're competitive people in D&D, is a one-upsmanship on who could make the best build. I've, I know it existed before when we would talk about the different power levels of different kits from 2nd edition, but 3rd edition just blew that bridge right up. Ever since then, it's always been about, ooh, what's, what's the bill that's going to give me the, the ability to do this, or have an untouchable armor class, or this and that. And that's never been what I've been about, but it's something that's now a part of the game, and you yeah, can't get around it. Prestige classes really made that a, a crazy exercise. And also remember, at this time, too, they were still printing out Dungeon Magazine and Dragon Magazine, and Dragon Magazine kept pumping more prestige classes as they thought of them and put them out into the world. So keeping track of it was a little rough. I used to have a collection of Dragon Magazines that covered much of 3rd edition and had dozens of prestige classes in them, as well as expanding out the different other elements that Wizards of the Coast was interested in, in terms of Dungeons and Dragons, so... <clears throat> then a couple of the other more important books that I consider, uh, when you consider 3rd edition 3.5, the Forgotten Realms source book. Uh, absolutely critical in my mind. Uh, again, this has so much world building in it, massive amounts of plot hooks, but it also has some really keynote prestige classes, especially the Archmage and the Hierophant. But uh, just a lot. Purple Dragon Knights, and I, I'm not going to go into all of it. This has a lot of really good stuff. If you're interested in the Forgotten Realms at all, this can help your game become much more true to the world. So if somebody has been reading, for instance, uh, Greenwood's books or Salvatore's books, this helps to add that extra flavor and dash, and I consider it to be an absolutely critical book for anybody in 3rd edition. <clears throat> also, because I can't help myself, I got Oriental Adventures. Um, 
again, I'm not a huge fan of it put into Dungeons & Dragons. This one had a massive amount of prestige classes, and it also was a bridge. I, I'm still amazed at this. But it was a bridge into Rokugan, which was the world of Legend of the Five Rings. So you had, basically, a Rokugan crossover source book, which was fascinating. Uh, the prestige classes in there, many of them were completely broken. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into all the details and criticals on that. Uh, I actually took one prestige class in there that allowed me to add just straight up plus 11 to my, my armor class. Um, because the DM didn't care and just said, yeah, you can take it, go ahead. As long as you qualify for it, you can take it. And there's just some stuff in there that's just insane. So, uh, use with caution, as with any of these things. Uh, another one, uh, the Epic Level Handbook. This one I both love and hate. Love because it gives hope that, you know, there is life after a certain point and that you can play beloved characters and keep playing them and playing them and playing them. On the other hand, this was such a pain in the butt to run for. When you get up to a certain point in the third edition, unless you really love the math, unless you really love long slog combats that you can't really shorten by much, this, when we took characters up to 28th level, I believe it was, I was just gassed by the end of it. It's just so much. Um, so while there's some cool stuff in here, it also sparked a lot of really broken game mechanics and just odd things. You know, with a high enough skill roll, you can bypass physics. Um, granted, those difficulties are usually up in the 50s range, but with magical items and a bunch of silly feats, you can launch yourself into ridiculous levels like that. So, yeah. Um, both a good book to learn from, especially if you're going to think about making games for super high-level characters and even superheroes. Um, that game might give you some ideas, um, although I can't say, I, like I said, I enjoyed running that game. Uh, so, now I think we're going to look at some of the... These are books that I... Oh, yeah, this is another really good one. The Hero Builder's Guide. The Hero Builder's Guide book gives you all kinds of things that you can use, not just for D&D, but for any character you run. This helps to build backstory. It helps to build purpose and set your character on a vector to go into the adventure. DMs should know this stuff. Game masters of any games, this is a great book to have to give you ideas on how to guide your players to building in better connections with their characters. Excellent book. Can't recommend that one enough. Maybe not all questions in it and, and things are useful for all characters and all games, but still, it's a pretty darn good book. Then, because the person that I got this from really loved these compilation books, we have The Complete Arcane, we have The Complete Divine, we have The Complete Warrior. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of those books in general. I thought with the books that I already had, I didn't need most of this stuff. But it, they basically are compilation books. They take all those other books and just kind of smoosh them together. Uh, along some fairly broad lines, and a couple other ideas that they trickled out, but I never found them that compelling that I needed them. Maybe on further review I'll change my tune on a couple of them, but again, by this time, D&D &D as a core was kind of flailing out in all directions because you had a huge demand, and they were trying to satisfy it, but at the same time they had to satisfy it before some other third party came along and filled that gap. As you will soon see, some of the third party stuff that was coming out at that time was kind of in a danger of going into areas that Wizards of the Coast probably would have preferred to till and harvest themselves. Oh, I got the basic uh, Cyanix Handbook too, not just the advanced one. Uh, this is the first one, and uh, that's the one that my player actually used in that epic campaign. Ah, uh, Savage Species. Again, remember what I said about the hu the Humanoids book that, you know, people have been fascinated about the idea of playing monsters. This one had a lot of interesting ideas when it came to playing uh, Humanoids in 3rd uh, edition, but it took it farther than that. Some of the characters in there aren't just Humanoids. And the ideas of playing giants or other classes is kind of neat. Um... <clears throat> Before this came out, I actually ran a game where all the player characters were dragons. Hatchling dragons. Uh, two golds, I believe. 
and they were brothers in the same clutch, and uh, they were leveling up. They were they were they were learning, you know, human adventuring crafts, which I thought was kind of a neat idea. Obviously, the challenges had to be consider considerably higher because they were still dragons, but they could turn to a dragon and fight, or they could stay in their human form and, and fight pretty effectively that way too, um, especially the one that was a wizard. Uh, so yeah, it was uh, a fun game, but with Savage Species, some of the elements from that could have been even a little bit more interesting. Some of the, the feats and the character abilities and things like that I thought would, would have been really good. Um, was it absolutely essential? No. It really isn't that hard to make uh, characters, especially if you have benchmarks like the Forgotten Realms book that have uh, character races that are more powerful than humans inherently, like the drow, um, and show you what an ef effective character level is. Basically, once the monster has a certain power level, you just basically add that on as effective levels. It works pretty well. The Savage Species, though, allows you to take a character, like say you take a Frost Giant. If you're a first level and have a first level party, your Frost Giant is really puny. So you, as you level up, they're going to level up in Frost Giant and grow into their powers, which was kind of an odd concept, but it kind of worked a little bit. Um, never really applied it in practice, though, because I am not a huge fan of monsters as player characters. So, why did I get that? I'll get back to you on that one. So, um, I ran a Viking campaign. I got Frostburn. Uh, all about playing out in the Arctic environments. Um, all in all, it's an okay book. It's very obviously, unless you travel in places like that. So if you're going to be playing a Sword Coast Adventures and you want to go up to, you know, Icebire Peak or something like that, then yeah, that becomes a kind of a useful book. Not a absolutely essential book, mind you. Just a useful one. So take that into account. Okay, the rest of the ones that I have here are third-party books. <coughs> But they're tied, obviously, into the Open Gaming License and 3rd Edition. So, Ravenloft. This is by Swords and Sorcery Games. And, uh, yeah, it's the ideas of Ravenloft. And Wizards of the Coast said we're not interested in exploring out that way. I don't know if they licensed. They must have licensed it, obviously, because they did own all the trademarks from TSR. So since they had the Ravenloft campaign, they could license out the Ravenloft title to Swords and Swords and Sorcery. Uh, <clears throat> added on to that was Ravenloft's Richten, uh, Van Richten's Arsenal. It kind of helps to flesh out a, a Ravenloft campaign. That being said, I never ran a Ravenloft campaign in 3rd edition. Um, never really had time to. Um, although I'm interested in the concept of the Ravenloft domain and and the, the campaign setting, um... I don't, th I don't find that horror works very well in, in Dungeons and Dragons in general. The characters are too powerful and too capable of defending themselves, and there's only so many times when you can hear your attacks bounce off the creature without hurting them that you just kind of get burned out by the whole thing. Especially with modern player sentimentality that, yeah, we can beat every encounter and things are always fair. They're not in Ravenloft, and people shouldn't have that delusion walking forward. Uh, I have a number of Legends and Lairs books which uh, Fantasy Flight Games, that was their venture into 3rd edition. We have the Mastercraft Anthology, which I got at a just totally cheap price, but I believe this is mostly going to be about your... Um, yes, it's going to have some prestige classes in it that they co cooked up. Uh, also, uh, a collected, collected lore of Legends and Lairs. This was kind of an attractive to get other people into the Legends and Lairs and show that their stuff was pretty good, which it really was. Traps and Treachery. Honestly, surprised... No, I'm not terribly surprised, honestly, that it took a third party to come out with something like this. But I've always been attracted to books like Grimtooth's Traps and such, but uh, something that's purely about setting up that almost neglected element that explorers and dungeoneers have had to deal with the fact that there's some truly diabolical traps out there um, not all of which can just be solved by a simple dice roll either um, but they came out with this to supplement the D&D &D, and I could always back in the day make my players nervous that they came in and saw me perusing that book uh, the Seafarer's Handbook which I thought was a nice compliment to 
uh, nautical rules, also much uh, much needed uh, elements for boats and naval combat and such. And uh, for comedy, I have uh, Tracing Curtis Heckman's XDM, all about leveling up your game. Now, there's some useful stuff in here about how to be a better game master in general. There's also some just weird stuff. They talk about having effects like pyros, uh, using things like flash paper. So some of the stuff is silly. They also mention some minor palmistry magic tricks to entertain and amuse yourself and, and kids and gamers when you can pull off a trick instead of just describing your players doing it or your characters doing it. Um, in general, I find it to be a fairly silly book. Um, but it's got some some kernels of useful stuff in it that someday we're going to mine. Um, <clears throat> but it's it's okay. It's certainly something you can skip in a game in a game store. I got it for dirt cheap, which is why I own it. And then finally, a cursed book, a book that I almost just flat out don't allow. And this is AEG's Feats. Uh, this book is, of course, uh, there to attract players. And they have a lot of feats in here. It's just packed. And in some cases, it's probably a compilation of a lot of AEG stuff. But there's just some stuff in there that is completely trivial and pointless to take as a feat for your characters. There are things in there that are absolutely ridiculously powerful. Some of them with chains of feats, but honestly, when you're playing as a warrior, a fighter, you're going to have a lot of feats. So some of these are just broken. There's one, if you sneak attack and successfully hit a character, you kill them automatically, no matter how many hit points they have. It's just, no, 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 not having it. So I, I have the book for reasons that are almost entirely unknown to me, but uh, it is an example of books that I find to be cursed and not allowed, or at least it's... I. Tr treat it with tongs. I hold it at a distance and you'd have to really explain to me why you're getting something out of that book. And there are some that are okay. There are some that are silly, some that are trivial, but several that are just overpowered chains that, quite frankly, I would not have in the game again. So this, it became mostly known to me. Uh, I wasn't as critical as I should have been for a game that I played running Vikings. And one person went up the shield tree. I mean, you know, shields. Shields are relatively inoffensive things. But going up the tree, his shield suddenly gave him a plus 10 to his armor class. In a low magic campaign, it was, you know, he could stand in front of 100 men throwing spears and maybe get by two or three of them. It was that sick. So after a while, I started thinking, and, you know, a lot of the stuff in there is just blanket ban. So you have to take control, control and ownership of your game, and that's, a, that's an example of that. So, those are not all of my 3rd edition books, but they're the majority of the ones that have rules in them and content that I would you know, use going forward. Obviously, I've got uh, Adventures, I've got uh, like a box set or two here and there, uh, lots and lots of modules for 3rd edition, but not really in the scope of this video. Uh, this just kind of, again, shows you uh, how I've watched games evolve. And this, as a clear evolution from 2nd edition Dungeons & Dragons, taking elements of the old, putting in a lot of new things, totally new co coat of paint and a direction for their art, which, is, which was very good. Um, <clears throat> and then an example of how third parties and allowing them to e explore and expand your game while you're making it can be very interesting and possibly kind of threatening. But uh, that's all stuff that we'll talk about further in other videos. But I hope you've enjoyed this one. And again, this is kind of to, if you're interested in any of the stuff that I just showed, if you're looking at something in, the, in a bookstore and you're like, huh, I wonder if that was any good. Hey, if I had it, I have no problems looking at it and giving you a quick review, a quick synopsis so that uh, you can make a more informed buying decision. And if you're interested in going back into 3rd edition, there's a lot of good things to be said about 3rd edition Dungeons & Dragons. These are many of the books that I consider to be pretty good to have, awfully good to have, to almost essential to have. So, at any rate, thank you for joining me. I'm Rob. This has been another session in the Dungeon Tutor. 
Christmas series. And uh, again, if you liked it, uh, feel free to like, subscribe, share with your friends, but most importantly, comment. Uh, if you want to see things, if you think something was covered well, if you think I, I, I gave short shrift to anything, absolutely, let me know. If you really loved the Feats book, and let's be honest, you didn't do it just because it allowed you to power game, um, then, yeah, let me know. I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much, and I will see you next time, hopefully, here in the Dungeon Tutor. Thank you, and farewell.